James Altucher, welcome. Ash, thanks so much for once again having me on the show. This is great. Yeah, we just brought you in for like a five minute segment for Real Vision Daily Briefing. And there was just no way that we were even going to scratch the service. We're gra- glad to have you here for a long time. Well, we're, we're trying to save the most important city on the planet. So we're, we're going to put in the time. It's a pretty noble cause, right? Yes. So, James, listen, before I go in and list all of your accomplishments so I don't sound like your press agent, tell us a little bit about your background because you have one of the most interesting stories uh, in terms of guests that we've had on this show. Yeah, I sort of have have had two careers all along. Like I was a hedge fund manager and also a writer. And I've I've written about 20 books on topics ranging from finance and investing to more self-help and how you bounce back from failure, which I've experienced many times. I've been an entrepreneur. And now I have a, a podcast. So, you know, fortunately, I've been able to have on a lot of economists, epidemiologists, virologists, Federal Reserve governors, billionaires, whatever, to kind of analyze the situation from a lot of different angles. And I think that's been very, you know, use. I've been grateful that I've been able to be of some use to to my listeners. That's great. There's a lot to talk about. So let's jump in with how you got to be in the middle of a firestorm of controversy here in late yeah. August, September of 2020. Yeah. And first, let me say, I didn't mean to become the most hated person in New York City. Like, I feel like I'm going to if I walk outside in New York City, I'm going to get beaten up or something. But which has happened to me before, but that's OK. But uh, I I was concerned. So, so this article I wrote on August 13th was titled New York City is dead forever. Here's why. And then I got a lot of controversy that week. Uh, just everybody, uh, maybe something like 10 tweets a second for seven straight days. And, and not everybody was against it, but the people you hear from are just angry, insane people in general. Until 10 days later, I wake up and on a Monday morning and Jerry Seinfeld, who's never written an article before in his life, he wrote an entire one page New York Times article trashing me and call like every, every as I mentioned in another segment, uh, he, everybody was texting me when I was waking up. Hey, putz. Hey, putz, you're a putz, James. And I'm like, who call, why is everybody doing this? Who calls anyone a putz? That's like, is that it? That's like a hundred year old Yiddish word or something. And, <laughs> and then I realized Seinfeld had, had done this. And then another friend calls me up and says, see, this is proof we're in a virtual reality simulation because it, you wake up one day and Seinfeld trashes you for an entire page in the New York Times. And that's just a normal day in 2020. Like, yeah. welcome to 2020. And so, you know, so but but the reason I wrote the article was not to take any glee in what was happening. I was actually very upset. Like, I'm I'm born in New York. I, I, I've lived in New York my entire New York City in my entire adult life. I own a storefront business in New York City and my kids go to school there. You know, and I was seeing lots of problems, like rest, m- many more restaurants permanently closed than I could have possibly expected. I was seeing, you know, apartment vacancies at an all-time high. On top of the fact that another four hundred thousand people had left the city since since March, and then I was, and I was like everyone else, thinking, oh, maybe they'll all come back once this is over. But then I started talking to people, and I was screenshotting about a dozen or more friends a day who were saying, well, after. 87 years in New York City, I'm, we're packing the bags and, and moving. And people were moving all over the country. And I started thinking, well, don't they have to go back to work? And I, then I was seeing article after article about, you know, bandwidth uh, was allowing companies to cut costs and, and, and um, back out of leases in Midtown. And people would tell me, ah, don't worry about it. Midtown is not New York City, right? But I would say, no, but it's like a you know, a hundred billion in revenues or, t- and, and, and hundreds of millions in taxes. Like if right. you lose all the people and you lose all the companies and, and I haven't even touched the surface of a lot of the problems, but, but the real problem is with deficits spiking higher and tax revenues collapsing, how do you pay for police, teachers, EMTs, transit workers, um, garbage collectors, firemen? And so I started to mention this in, in my original article, August 13th, and then, you know, now two weeks later, de Blasio is right on the fence. He's about to potentially fire 22,000 city workers, workers he had promised he would never fire. And I don't even want to blame de Blasio. Everyone's blaming him. But because uh, these the initial problems I wrote about were 
coronavirus or not, the economic lockdown has consequences. And the, the consequence is that the infrastructure of New York City might have already collapsed. Right. And so I was worried. And so I wanted people to say, wake up. But instead, you know, everybody was like, oh, grit will get us back. You know, New York City always comes back. This guy just doesn't have any grit. He must be from Iowa or something like that. And, you know, I would remind at least my friends, I was living a couple blocks from 9-11 during 9-11. I was living on Wall Street during the financial crisis. Like, I, I love New York City. I'm fourth generation New Yorker. I don't want these problems to, I don't want New York City to die, but these are real problems and I, I wish, and, and they're hard to come up with solutions or else I would have tried to, to do that a little bit more. You know, this is a fascinating story and your angle on it is fascinating to me for two reasons. One, because it's a it's a great pop culture zeitgeist story and it is hilarious that Jerry Seinfeld wrote a full page in the New York Times yelling yeah. about this, which is surreal beyond measure. But second, because you, you know, in addition to doing the podcast and writing and doing other things, you're a former hedge fund manager. You think about macro issues. You think about issues uh, that involve cities. You think about financial issues. You think about this in a really analytic way. So I'm curious, you know, aside from the pop culture insanity around all of this particular article, what do you think is actually happening under the surface of here when it comes to the finances of New York City and the beating heart of the financial center of the United States? Well, you know, that's a great point because I think early on de Blasio had to put on his lobbying hat or whatever you want to call it. He really needed to advocate for New York City early on. I will say out of any mistake he's make, made recently, uh, I don't know, but all along he should have been advocating that, hey, New York City needs to stand up tall. This is the flagship uh, city of the United States in terms of financially dealing with every other country. He really could have gone to bat for this a little a little more and been in D.C. a little bit more. I mean, Washington, D.C. is on vacation while the MTA just announced they need a $12 billion bailout. That's The MTA is the transit authority. And so that one department by itself is losing $200 million a week and needs a $12 billion bailout. They just announced that a few days ago. And uh, meanwhile, de Blasio needs another $5 billion on top of that to keep the 22,000 people he is thinking of laying off. And that's 6% of the city's workforce. And by the way, that's only the beginning. We, we haven't even seen whether the tax revenues come in or not yet for this year. They're not going to come in. And next year it's gonna be worse because there's this whole flight out of New York now. And you're seeing this on the real estate side. Like it's no, it's not like every city, 400,000 people are leaving. Some cities, real estate is insane. Real estate is going through the roof in some in some second or third tier cities. Like people are buying houses sight unseen, fifty percent higher than the listing price. And and I'm not making that up. Like you could just Google that, and that's in every newspaper, uh, every local newspaper where they, they they see the data. So it's a scary trend. But the uh, the optimistic thing is is that for the first time ever, opportunity is now dispersed you know, throughout the country. It's decentralized. It's no longer just in New York City, LA, San Francisco. You could be a young person and find success anywhere now. But, you know, we're all, we're all we all got comfortable commu communicating remotely. And a lot of talented and skilled people are leaving the major cities, but particularly New York City, unfortunately. And unfortunately, though, I don't know what you do about New York City. The only thing I was thinking, and I'd, I'd be curious what, what you were thinking, is if the Federal Reserve itself comes in and buys a lot of all the debt, basically. So it doesn't let it buys all of New York City's debt and restructures it so that New York City could borrow more. It's not a great solution, but at least it will allow New York City to continue with police and healthcare, you know, New York City owns all the hospitals, like 27 right. hospitals. So all these things could fall apart if New York City doesn't figure out some way to raise $50 billion. 
James, you know, you're a finance guy, longtime New York City person. I'm sure you'll geek out on this too. It reminds me, 1970s, I think it was Abe Beam was mayor, Felix Rowett, and the idea that New York City almost, or some people argue, did default on its municipal bonds. There were all of these challenges that we're talking about now, garbage collection, police, fire, all these things that needed to be paid, no sources of revenue from it. The famous headline, I think in the Daily News, Ford to New York, drop dead. Is that what we're headed back to? Uh, you know, I've thought I, originally before I wrote the article and I was seeing the problems around me, I was hoping that is was the worst case scenario. But let's not forget. And a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, New York City will head back to the 70s and finally people will artists will move back in and people can afford to live in Manhattan. And they have this vision of the 70s like it was some sort of artistic utopia that that wealthy gentrifiers ruined. That is totally, I was there in the 70s. That's totally not what happened. New York City was kind of disgusting in the 70s. It was really horrible. It was not a safe place. I don't know if it was the murder capital of the country or the world. Uh, it was a very bad place. Uh, and here's the difference. There's a couple of differences. One is not, there was not a single day that New York City itself, that industry was closed down. All of Wall Street, the, the corporate headquarters of every single investment bank was on Wall Street. There was nothing you could do about it. They had to be all hooked up right into the exchange. They had to be on Wall Street. The entire advertising industry of the country, if not the world, was on Madison and Avenue. The entire media industry was on Sixth Avenue. So these were, were long-standing industries that, that never closed down. Now, uh, you know, back in, uh, let's even just go to 2008, the average bandwidth was two and a half megabits per second. We would not be able to have a video conversation at two and a half megabits per second just in 2008. So that's why when people say, oh, we survived 2008, we, everybody had to come, nobody left town. You had to, you had to be in New York City. Now our average bandwidth is 40 megabits per second, each, each person, that's just an average. Some people's much higher. So companies realize this, there's been a lot of scientific research that productivity has actually gone up in the past few months. There's a lot of a lot of evidence also, like Jerry Seinfeld, the one problem, two problems he addressed, but one of them was, uh, you know, people absolutely, he said, people absolutely hate working remotely. It's not really true. Like there's been all sorts of surveys, uh, more than half the country likes working remotely. And so I don't know, I mean, I don't know, a, a cubicle is six, by six feet and you have to be like best friends with all your cubicle. Nobody likes being best friends with all their cubicle mates and then sharing a bathroom with them. Like even in jail, you have an eight by eight cell and you, and you get your own bathroom and you're allowed just to be clear, you're allowed to have loving, intimate relationships in jail, but not in the workplace. <laughs> no one, no one likes working at, at work, I would argue. And, yeah. and the evidence bears that out, that, that at least half, more than half the country likes working from home. So, and the other thing Jerry mentioned, which is really true actually, is there's a certain energy to cities. There's this, you exchange ideas, you meet other young people. That's very true, but you still need to have tax revenues. Like if New York City tried to borrow now, like in the seventies, New York City was able to borrow because there was a reason there was a reasonable argument like, hey, if we clean the subways, if we fix up the hotels, if we clean Grand Central and, and clear crime out, then more people will come to New York and we'll be able to pay back our debts. But right. if somebody if New York City borrows money now and, and look, there are lenders out there because there will there will always be lenders for New York City. But if New York City borrows now, where do the revenues come from to pay it back? It's not so clear. You have to really think, like everybody's already left. 400,000 people have left and more are leaving every single day. Like it's only in the past few days that we're seeing the news that you can't even rent a U-Haul, that you can't get a real estate agent on the phone in any other city because there are all these New Yorkers are coming out. There's lines of U-Hauls going onto the GW bridge. So it, yes, maybe young people will come in, but you still need tax revenues. And meanwhile, deficits because of the virus are spiking higher and and revenues are important. You, you, you pay for everything, you pay for your city that way. And also if, let's say there's no indoor dining by 2021, as both de Blasio and Governor Cuomo has said is going to happen, there's gonna be no indoor dining. 95% of restaurants will go out of business, just gone. They will never ever reopen, which is about half a million jobs 
in the city. And that has repercussions. That means tourism goes down. That means all the jobs related to tourism go away. That means the, you know, it, it keeps on cascading out. All the, you know, the subway infrastructure starts to go down because less people are taking the subway. And meanwhile, the MTA needs a bailout anyway. So right. all these repercussions, it just is scary thinking, where does that end? Whereas in the 70s, you could sort of say, all right, well, if the banks restructure, you can make an argument for the for borrowing. You can't do it right now. Yeah, you know, two two things. First, I think Seinfeld Altucher debate right here on Real Vision. Or better yet, Altucher Seinfeld. You're gonna be the lead on this one. <laughs> uh, you, you mean if I was talking to Jerry? Yeah, we'll get you on. We'll have you debate. My daughter asked me, what what would you do if you could if Jerry Seinfeld just called you, what would you say to him? Or if he was standing right here? And I I said I would walk away because <laughs> other than the name Seinfeld, if some random person just wrote a, a page in the New York Times about you just insulting you and not addressing any of the actual issues, very important issues you bring up and, and, and is acknowledged by all the press that these are important issues, uh, you would never talk to that person again. Like, <laughs> but because it's like Jerry Seinfeld, I'm supposed to want to talk to him now. I don't know, I, I, I am a big fan of his comedy. I own part of a comedy club that he's performed at many times. And I don't know, I'm, I'm happy his voice is in the issue and that and that he was able to point out my article to people like de Blasio and Cuomo, who also then spoke right. about it. And maybe it will make them kind of more incentive to prove me wrong. And I, I hope that's right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, right now, I still don't see a single person addressing things other than saying nobody wants to be remote, which is not true. And right. New York City's got grit and you don't. And regardless of whether I have any grit or not, grit does not plug a $50 billion hole, which yeah. is the minimum New York City needs. You know, that's such a key point. But by, by the way, Jerry, if you're a Real Vision subscriber, reach out to us. <laughs> I'll try and convince James to debate you. Uh, but this gap, this $50 billion gap, you know, the question that, that I have, and I think about the processional effects here and how positive feedback loops develop in financial markets, what the hell is going to happen to commercial real estate? Well, commercial real estate, so I've, I've spoken to some, um, you know, commercial real estate's dominated by uh, a few company, a few big companies, and then some very large, wealthy families that have been buying New York City, you know, New York City real estate for a hundred years. And I would say that, the, particularly the younger generations and the newer real estate companies, they're in big trouble. Like they're going to go bankrupt, and that's going to go up to the banks. The banks are going to have problems, but the banks have already sold off a lot of the debt to hedge funds. And so who pays, who invests in hedge funds? Well, 401k plans, pension plans. In other words, you invest in hedge funds through your 401k and through your IRA and so on. And the, the, the American taxpayer is going to pay for the bankruptcies in, in New York City real estate. Yeah. Nobody else, you know, what will happen is a few landlords will go bankrupt. That's sad for them, but you know, that's not 8 million people. And uh, the banks, We'll say, whoops, we can't, you know, the bank's job is to just service the debt, but they already sold the debt, like I said, to these institutions right. and they slice it up so much that even the institutions don't have any idea what they own. And so it's all, all those losses are passed through to the taxpayer. I mean, you know, the, the immediate takeaway there and something that I've been thinking about pretty extensively is this isn't like an Upper East Side, Upper West Side story. This is a national story. If New York City has massive financial problems, if it becomes destabilized fiscally, financially, it is a challenge that is going to reverberate around the country. Yeah, I mean, it's going to it is. And again, though, the positive is that many, many, many second and third tier cities, all of them will benefit, if that's the way to put it. And, and they'll benefit from the money coming out of New York City. There's definitely a, a, an exodus of money. And they'll benefit from, you know, let's say a talented chef, his restaurant or her restaurant closes down and now she's in Nashville and we'll set up a new restaurant there once she raises money and so on. But think about it, like Broadway is now closed through, you know, it, it closed down in March when everything, everything else closed and it'll be closed until next March, so a year. Yeah. So who is waiting around? Are the actors just waiting or did, have they already left? We don't know. What about the stagehands? What about the, the thousand restaurants that service Broadway? Like, like people say, oh, he's gonna miss Broadway. I hate Broadway. 
uh, I do. I will never go to a Broadway show. I can't stand them. But you have to acknowledge what really is here. Like there's thousands of restaurants that cater to Broadway. Every hotel in that area caters to Broadway. So hundred million in tourism revenues or more that cater to Broadway. And then to think that, oh, it'll all be back after the vaccine. Who's bringing it back? Like, are, would you invest in a Broadway show knowing that you can easily go bankrupt on it if there's another virus or another pandemic or a fourth wave or the vaccine doesn't work? Like, nobody's gonna take these chances. If all the pizza places in New York City go out of business, who is going to wake up and say, finally, I'm gonna achieve my dream of opening a pizza restaurant in New York City? No, people are gonna wait and you're gonna have empty tenants. That's when all the bankruptcies will happen. Yes, over time, when all the bankruptcies are litigated through like three to five years out or, or longer, some rents will be cheaper, some won't be. And But meanwhile, the entire infrastructure of New York City will, will collapse unless they get some kind of extra bailout than any other city is going to get. Yeah. I mean, hey, think about like, well, how big is the state's bailout that they're debating? Like it's somewhere between 100 billion and a trillion, right? So let's say I haven't heard about any number greater than a trillion. So let's say it's a trillion. That's only 20 billion per state. New York City, I mean, New York State is in the whole 30 billion. How much, how much money is New York City gonna get? Yeah. I don't know. Open question. Yeah, and I hate to be like the prophet of doom here, but it's, I, you need, first off, I'm not the only one raising these issues, but I'm the one that people seem to hate for raising these issues. And I, I maybe because of, I don't know why, but, uh, People need to address these issues. And I keep saying, and everybody criticizing, I keep saying, well, fine, I hope I'm wrong. Let's come up with a solution. Give me ideas or you come up with ideas or something. And I'm even talking to mayoral candidates about this, like, what's your solution? And still, still I hear a lot of, you know, New York City always comes back. And I, don't, I just don't, usually you could see it, but this time I don't, I don't see it at all. Well, also that's not a solution, that's a bumper sticker. Right? Yeah. And, and it's, you know, if you want to feel good about yourself and look, I've, I've been in New York through this whole crisis and, uh, you know, I, sure, great grit and wonderful. But the reality is if the essential services aren't there, if there is a, a failure to provide, uh, you know, basic policing, uh, fire, firefighting uh, garbage. You know, I was out last night. I was out walking down Second Avenue with my buddy Joe, longtime finance guy. And we were marveling about how there was this renaissance Second Avenue Cafe Society, right? There were just tables out in the street and people seemed to be having a wonderful time. And for the most part, we're pretty well behaved with the masks and the social distancing. There's plexiglass up between tables in some of the restaurants. They're really doing a great job to try and be compliant and to try and make everything work. And yet there's stacks, piles of garbage bags lying on the street. It's really difficult when you do not have the infrastructure uh, for private industry to surpass or to or to manage to to coexist with those kinds of problems when you have those issues at the essential services layer. Yeah, and then what happens on top of that when you have an extra half a million people very quickly go unemployed because the restaurants all you know right now there's outdoor outdoors dining and and cafe culture, but what happens in December when it's zero degrees and there's no indoor dining? and you suddenly get a lot more people permanently unemployed instead of just furloughed. Yeah. I don't really know, like, I I hope there's the right bailouts. I hope people are creative with incentives, you know, but then, you know, and that's on top of the problems we currently this moment have, which haven't been realized yet because tax revenues haven't come in. I mean, in October they make their new budget, but we won't even really have a good sense of the, ta you know, how much tax revenues they've collected for the year. So. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be some wake up calls. And I hope that sense of excitement continues and people don't leave the city. But of course, we've already seen, you know, close to half a million people leave, maybe more by now. I mean, that that number is old, the half a million. And there's articles just in the past few days that there's a, yeah. a, a mass escape from the city, like they're making it more panicky than than it is. And look, Federal Reserve has announced they want to create inflation again. Maybe there's like a backdoor way for them to buy up all the debt and uh, say, you know, that's one way to save the city. It's not, James, it's not the, that much. The Fed, the Fed would never set up a special liquidity facility. They just don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> right, right. I forgot. They, they only buy treasury bills. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> They've got somebody in the basement who's like tied up in a leather mask and all he does is like buy debt all day long. So, well, you know, at this point, I would support it, obviously. If it, there's a, a national, uh, 
emergency that's happening and there's a, an impact to the city that really is the financial heartbeat of the country, we've got to do something to support it. I don't have any answers, but I agree with you. Look, even despite this burgeoning of cafe society outdoors, like, look, it, it's it's September. You know, we got another uh, 60 days of good weather if we're lucky, if we're lucky. And, uh, you know, th it's really hard to see with all the question marks out there how this is going to be uh, sustainable in the long term to just keep the to just keep the lights on and all the small businesses that are really the lifeblood of everything that we do and the reason that people want to be in this city and are willing to pay the ridiculous rents that we pay here uh, to do it. When you think about this with your uh, former hedge fund manager hat on, do you think that there is a way or are you thinking of a way uh, to express a view about this uh, in public markets, for example? Are there any opportunities that you think about uh, for what how this situation can be arbitraged? Uh, or what the investment play is on this. Yeah, I mean, on this specifically, it's tricky uh, because you don't know to what extent uh, many real estate companies might be exposed to to debt or, I mean, I would say there's, I would say there's nothing to do right now with real estate because there's gonna be so much volatility. And, and by the way, you can't really market time. So this is not me trying to time the market, but I am personally worried about volatility around the election. If you remember in 2000 with Gore Bush, uh, we didn't know the election right away and the market went down 8.4% between the election and the new year. So if we have Trump, Biden, and both sides are not conceding and it, you know November 5th, 10th, 15th passes, more than focusing on the economy, the market hates uncertainty. Yeah. So if the market does not know who the president of the United States is going to be, we've seen it before, there's precedent for this, it's not really that good for the stock market. But I think the best way to play any of this from the beginning is just focusing on all things remote. But that's already, you know, like Zoom, for instance, has already had a huge run up. Amazon has created it, are the first $200 billion man. So if I was really market timing, I would say cool out and be in cash. Or or I would say just stick with what you're in if you're in tech and you know be able to weather the volatility there you know some tech plays some plays related to law enforcement and cybersecurity you know chips for faster bandwidth uh chips for 5g and 6g uh automation of course so those are the real you know genomics these are the real trends that are like 10 20 30 year trends that are still developing i don't know of a quick way unless you're buying real estate that uh is in the south uh, I don't know of a real good short-term way to to play the demise of New York City. What about on the short side? Any short plays on this? I don't. I don't like to do that just because. What if there is a bailout? You know, what if everybody you know piles in short on some some REIT that focuses on New York City, and then someone specifically is you know a hedge fund manager is specifically aware of the short position and just bails out that one real estate company and it doubles in a day, then everyone's crushed. So yeah. I, I don't like, in such a dangerous situation, uh, I, I'm not thinking really of the investment, just I really just hope there are more solutions than I'm aware of for, for New York, and, and more solutions than just grit for, for New York City. Again, I would just stick with, what I'm doing is just sticking with the, the decades long trends that have, have been manifesting themselves in this environment, like again, remote and, law enforcement, some law enforcement uh, stocks, and you know those are the main things. So James, we've talked about a lot of the issues here. What do you think the worst case scenario here is? I've been thinking a lot about this. At, I'll describe where I've been wrong all along in this pandemic and the lockdowns and so on. So in March, I, was, I became like obsessed with the pandemic, as we all did, but I was, I, I have the fortunate opportunity that I have a podcast, so I called up the, maybe arguably the best epidemiologist that advises the EU on specifically this coronavirus, uh, Peter Openshaw from Imperial College. I spoke to various doctors, virologists. I spoke to economists on all the mathematical modeling and the Federal Reserve on how long we can handle these lockdowns. And, you know, there's two realities, which is one is that you can, the Fed can keep printing money, unlike what people think where, oh, there's going to be hyperinflation. Right now, we're in a massive, massive deflationary environment. Uh, and and so inflation, the Federal Reserve would love inflation. So they're going to just keep printing money as long as there's deflation. But where I was wrong was in January, and I even was saying this on the podcast, 
I was really scared because factories were closing in Wuhan. I didn't think the pandemic would come to the US. And I was really scared that all these factories were closing in Wuhan. And I realized every single business in the United States had no plan B. There was no supply chain plan B, except there was plan A was China and that was it. And so I remember even I was calling all my friends who were in manufacturing and, and needed s supplies from China. And they said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. So they were wrong and, and I was right, but I was wrong that it wouldn't come to the, pan uh, it wouldn't come here. But I was even saying at the time, like, look, there could even be unrest. And people were saying, no, no, that will, that would never happen in yeah. the U S. And so that phrase that will never happen in the U S I kept hearing all through January and then February. No, they'll never lock down the U S economy. How would we function? That'll never happen here. And then, oh no, it won't be longer than a month. That could never happen here. It certainly won't be past the summer. That could never happen here. And, and there won't be unrest and chaos. That could never happen. Cities won't go bankrupt. There always will be a bailout. And so when you have that happen, where everybody's saying this, it's like a slippery slope. And, and slippery slopes don't have good reputations in history. Yeah. So, what could happen next is, and you already hear people talking about this, but I think they're afraid to say it out loud. But if you don't, if, if, if there's a lot of chaos around the election, which we already know there's going to be, like I don't think anyone has any doubt there's gonna be chaos. Like there's already one model that I've seen where Trump could win by a, 100 electoral votes. And I'm not speaking about my political bias. I've just seen people talking about this. They'll still contest the election on the Democrat side. On the Republican side, also probably, even if Biden's ahead by that much, who knows? And so you're gonna have all this chaos, then there's gonna be president, then there's gonna be accusations of fraud. Uh, so there's there's three electric grids in the United States. There's East, West, and Texas. Yeah. And the only reason I know that is because people from the East, the West, and Texas have all told me, we'll just split off because we got our own electric grid. and. That might happen, or there might be some state that says, look, you're giving New York City $200 billion bailout. We don't want to pay for that with our taxes. We're just going to, we're going to constitutionally secede, or we'll do whatever you want. We'll do a trade deal. We'll, we'll pay you money, but we don't need the grief. And so Texas, we're out. And who knows, like that could happen. I, I don't think it will be I don't think it'll be bloody. It won't be like a civil war thing, but there'll certainly be protests and rioting continue. I mean, people have said on both sides, the rioting's gonna continue. But what will happen when all these states start to move away, the US federal will, will shrink and will have to uh, reduce its military. I mean, there are some bad scenarios in, in all of this. Right, you know, as we sit here in early September having this conversation, my first instinct is to say, James, that sounds incredibly far-fetched. Then again, yes. if we rewound the tape back to April and we talked about how the last four months have unfolded, I would have said everything that happened seems so far-fetched. Yeah. So it really does feel like, gosh, you just don't know at this point, right? Right, like Ash, if someone asked you in 2015, hey, Ash, where do you see yourself in five years? No matter what you said, you were wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, the answer was definitely not in my apartment 23 hours a day. I can assure you of that. Yeah. And and society itself, nobody would have guessed this. Yeah. You know, and again, I you don't know medically what the correct answer is, lockdowns, no lockdowns, but we do know economically, you can't shut down an economy for this long. You know, the word quarantine is derived from the Latin for 40 days. And typically the bubonic plague where they they would do they would shut they would pick up the gates of a city and they would shut it down for 40 days and that was enough to ride through the plague right the, the the you know now we're in a much different environment and we're 6 months later we're lo we're still locked down yeah so by that metric at least uh it's 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 it sounds i mean the words are, are hard to form but worse than the plague in terms of the economic impact in terms of the amount of time that is needed to try and tamp down the spread of the virus. I mean, the good thing is for us is that the plague back in the 1300s was much more fatal. Right. Uh, that's we're, we're we're blessed for that. But but yes, economically, yeah, we're just closing down the world's largest economy for six months. The entire world is affected, 
and angry and upset. People are scared. I mean, in New York City, there's, uh, you know, you see the, the food lines at, at food banks and churches and so on uh, are around the block five times. And yeah, uh, it's, it's scary what's going on out there yeah. right now. Well, that's exactly the point. You don't need a mortality rate that looks like the plague to cause economic chaos. You just need a mortality rate that's high enough that people are are willing to shut things down and say, we just, you know, human life, we need, we need to protect it. We need to take extraordinary measures. And then that, that balancing act, I mean, I'm relieved that I'm not the person who has to make those decisions. It's a terrible, terrible decision to have to make to figure out how you manage to keep an economy going while trying to maximize the saving of human life. It is a horrific trade-off. I agree because, you know, obviously we don't know what would have happened if there was no lockdown. I mean, you look at Sweden, which they don't really like touching each other anyway. I don't know. So they 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 kind of rode through this, and South Korea rode through this. So there were countries that didn't do any lockdown at all and survived. Clearly, there pop, there would have been more deaths, but there's still we don't have herd immunity now anyway, and right. we're, there's still going to be more deaths. It's, we did flatten the curve, so we spread it out for a longer amount of time now. But nobody in the beginning ever assumed we would be locked down forever until there's zero cases because that can't possibly happen. So yeah. we're going to achieve either a vaccine or herd immunity or medicine that is effective. Yeah. One of those three things, everybody in the world's going to be exposed to this virus at some point because we're not living under rocks for better or worse. If they had just shut down maybe for three weeks, everybody in the world, then it would have been gone and, and that's it. But that's not what happened. So um, now we we're in for the long haul and Again, what's the if you take this, it's just a worst case scenario, but I could definitely see red versus blue being separate, you know, entities in the United States and, and then throw in Texas, who never really liked the rest of the states anyway. And, you know, it's and hopefully a, a situation like that doesn't turn into bloodshed. I don't think it would, but you, you never know. There's, there's bloodshed now, even without that. So yeah. that's and people could say, well, look, the protests are have to do with a very important issue, not the virus. That's true. But would we have reached this state of anarchy? Uh, and clearly there's be blood being shed no matter which side you want to point the finger at. It's bloody. People are dying. New York City. What was it? There was like 30 shootings just on Saturday alone, as opposed to zero on the equivalent Saturday a year ago. So there's chaos. And that's only going to get worse the longer this happens. And then if you have uncertainty with the election and everybody, Twitter will turn into real life with everybody kind of just hating each other. That's a horrifying picture to paint. So James, I, now that we've talked about the worst case scenarios, do you have a sort of a, a framework for the dispersion of risk? Do you see a best case scenario? Do you see this potentially improving rapidly under a certain set of circumstances? Yeah. Uh, well, and again, I think you still need soft landings for New York City and then probably L.A. and San Francisco and London, Paris, Berlin. But let's not forget London, Paris, Berlin. These are cities that have been bombed before. They are cities that did survive the plague, actually, and they still exist. It just it took them decades or a century or two in the worst case scenarios to, to survive. So everything will come back at some point. But but forever is is not so long if you're about to get fired or if you're dealing with you know anarchy or or severe reduction in services or or many different or or, or death you know from illness so i do think second and third tier cities again no matter what are going to blossom and bloom in a way that has never happened before in the united states and that to your point ash that diversifies the risk of a 911 affecting the economy or a, a financial you know crash or whatever there, there's going to be many more opportunities for people remote and and bandwidth increasing has created like an amazing time of you know automation and ai and you know genomics and health and potentially even healthcare because we're going to now be much better in terms of how we respond the next time to a pandemic, I hope we're better at it and it's not as political. It's too bad this happened in an election year. It makes no sense that the same people who believe one thing about taxes also happen to believe the same thing, either for or against, about hydroxychloroquine. What a fantastic coincidence that 50 million people who believe in raising taxes are also against hydroxychloroquine and people and the other 50 million people who are for lowering taxes happen to be for hydroxychloroquine. How did that coincidence 
happen. It's because people took their political party and assumed that was objective truth all right. the way down on every issue when it's not. People are talking about being pro-science. Pro-science is about arguing and testing theories and being wrong and using science to find out what's right. It's not about, you know, oh, because I'm a Republican, I believe this, and because I'm a Democrat, I believe this about masks. Like, it doesn't make any sense how we've made decisions in this pandemic. So James, how are you positioning yourself personally? What are you doing? What steps are you taking? Are you hoarding gold under the Bankstrasse in Zurich? What's the plan? No, I'm, I'm not hoarding gold, although clearly gold was a, a I, I never like gold because ultimately, in, at the end of the day, gold is just a rock. Like, you still have to go through the banks and you have to go through the infrastructure to get uh, gold and pay all sorts of fees. And and then if if you go around that, like if you try to hold physical gold, how are you going to move? You can't carry, can't, you can't buy a house with the gold, You can't, uh, with gold. You can't actually buy anything in the world with gold. So I don't know why, you know, gold at some point will not be the default currency to flee from. It's a $9 trillion market though. And you have to look at, I, I, I have to say it, you have to look at Bitcoin. I think the reason Bitcoin has gone from 3,000 to 12,000 just during this time is that people were like, oh gosh, what a relief that at the very least I could flee towards Bitcoin. I don't have to, just in case the dollar does hyperinflate or the US has some major issues, I could store some percentage of my net worth in Bitcoin and it's much more resilient than it's ever been before. There's many more resources to, to get it, to hide it, to save it, uh, to spend it. So I think I, but, but so there's, a, you know, I'm, I'm positioning a little in Bitcoin, but also tech is, is, is not going anywhere. Amazon, they, they're, they're, they're making drones to deliver to you in five minutes in every, uh, you know, in every area of the U S so, and then you have, uh, you know, I'm, again, I, I like to invest where there's problems. So there's problems in law enforcement right now. There's problems in tech, like bandwidth could be better. You know, software packages like Skype or Zoom could be better. James, so, let, me, let me just ask, when you look at some of these valuations, when you look at, at Amazon trading at 100 plus trailing 12 month uh, PEs, you look at Amazon, I think over 30 uh, TTM basis. These are some really rich valuations. Yeah, I, it, but you know, what's gonna happen when you know, Amazon right now is sending up satellites into space so that they could bring a uh, high speed bandwidth to many parts of the world to, to bil a billion people or more who don't currently have high speed bandwidth. You know, they have this, it's called Project Kuipers, uh, K U I P E R S. So Amazon and Google and Facebook, they all have huge areas that are under recognized right now that are, are could catapult them to much greater growth. They're not, they're not fully mature companies yet, is what I'm saying. They're, they're gonna grow uh, very fast in the future as well, even though they've all grown a lot in the past 20 years. And, but also, yeah, there's opportunities in small cap tech. Who's making the chips for these satellites? Who's making you know, the controllers? Who's making the software for them? Who's dealing with the cybersecurity issues for, for all this new bandwidth? Who's dealing with uh, um, you know, digital storage is gonna go up uh, incredibly, like the amount of data created every day now is more than the amount of data the entire world created from the year zero to the year 2000. So, right. you know, it's, it's storage is a huge issue. So yeah, I'm, I'm not in Amazon for instance, but I, for me, I like to, uh, I'm also an, for the first time in a really long time, I'm an ex, I'm excited about entrepreneurial opportunities. So there's a lot of great entrepreneurial opportunities out there that never existed before. So you can, you what, can, what types of things are you thinking about when you say that? Well, some things require some technical skills and some things require softer skills like good marketing and sales skills. But, you know, an example is the online newsletter business is, is, is booming right now. So yeah. if you're you know, like you take, check out a site like Substack.com, for instance, they allow people in just three minutes to set up a subscription newsletter. So Substack if you were really- And Patreon on the video and audio and uh, podcasting side. I mean, there's just, it's like a renaissance of, 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 of monetization platforms. Right, like people used to pitch TV shows, but now the best podcasters who are on, who also hook up to Patreon, they're making like 30, 40, 50,000 or more per month. So they don't, 
why would they waste time pitching a TV show which is on the decline? So there's all these, and some people, somebody could be listening to this and say, well, I'm not one of those people. Well, okay, you could just be a, a, a cook and, and have a very particular specialty and create an online newsletter of recipes. Or you could be a, a, P, you know, a trainer, a physical trainer, and create a YouTube channel streaming you know, your, your training business online, and you could scale up much more. You could write, uh, you, know, you could create an online course. A friend of mine created an, an online course, how to create a, a good cold email which is a skill more needed than ever because of remote sales. And his course is making, is paying his rent. So, and that's not a newsletter, that's a course. Or you could be, uh, you could start off as a virtual assistant and go to a dentist or, or a law firm and say, hey, you could make probably 10X revenues if you set up your Instagram account or if you manage your social media accounts better, I'll do it for you. And then you could use that to scale into a, a virtual agency, you know, helping law firms or dentists, places that don't normally, that have the money, but they don't normally have a, a big social media presence. It's a huge opportunity there. Uh, so I could go on and on with, you know, types of opportunities that exist out there. That's, that's really what I've been focused on the past few months is figuring out where all the opportunities are, not just for high tech people, but, but for anybody. James, we're going to have to have you back on to talk more about tech investing and talk more about entrepreneurship. There's so many opportunities uh, despite, I mean, that's the really fascinating thing is how bifurcating this conversation is. There's so much to be sort of very skeptical about even, uh, you know, thinking about how you're going to position yourself to survive some of these very challenging times that may lie ahead. And on the other, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. It's such an unusual time in that sense. It is very unusual because the way I describe it is the economy is not two-dimensional anymore. It used to be two-dimensional, meaning is the economy up or is the economy down? And the, the economy right now is, is very 3D. It's tilted, meaning there's a, an extra trillion dollars that's hitting the economy that still hasn't been spent from the first bailout. And the Federal Reserve is spending trillions on buying up debt. So there's so much money in the economy that it's it's okay to to look for opportunities, they just aren't in the usual spots because everything's tilted. That's why I say, think about second and third tier cities. Or if you're, a, let's say you were a wedding planner and now, and I'm, I'm just thinking of a random job that you might think is hopeless because nobody's having outdoor weddings. Well, but people are having Zoom weddings. I've been invited to two Zoom weddings. Those are very difficult to plan also, and you could scale up much more easily by thinking of what you do and thinking, how is this going to translate to a more remote world? Because even when there is a vaccine, people are going to be some percentage of people are going to be afraid to fly for a while and on and on. There's there's things to do online. There's stories to tell, even if you're not technical. You don't have to be technical to be a online wedding planner. The Tilted 3D Economy. That sounds like a great title for your next book. I, you know, maybe I, maybe that will be actually, I've been thinking of a title for the next one. <laughs> well, either way, we'll have you back on to discuss it. Full James, tilt. Full tilt. James Altucher, thanks for joining us. Ash, once again, thank you for having me on the show. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.